Welcome everybody to 2021 Glyconet ACS Collaborative Seminar Series. It's my immense pleasure to introduce a good friend and collaborator of mine, Jia Niu. So Jia is zooming in from Boston College where he is a uh, assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry. Jia obtained his undergraduate degree from Tsinghua University in China prior to moving to Harvard, where he conducted his PhD work in David Liu's lab on enzyme-free translation and directed evolution. Jia then conducted a postdoctoral fellowship with Craig Hawker and Tom So at the University of California in Santa Barbara. And he um, initiated his group at uh, Boston College just a few short years ago um, with a focus on sulfation chemistry, on carbohydrates and peptides, as well as um, some work in um, genome editing as well. Uh, Jia's program has been immensely um, productive and well-recognized already. I think he'll tell us about some of the chemistry he's done on osulfation of carbohydrates and peptides today. Jia, thank you so much for coming today, and um, we're looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you, Christina, for the overly generous introduction, and uh, I'm very honored to be here. And, uh, and this is my first time actually uh, presenting in GlycoNet and uh, such a wonderful opportunity. And I also got to know uh, other presenters from, by watching their YouTube uh, uh, videos. Um, so it's, I think this is a great opportunity. And uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Christina and all the other organizers for inviting me. Um, so today uh, it's my pleasure to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, our recent progress in the early stage of sulfation of uh, carbohydrates and the peptides. All right, sulfation uh, is a critical uh, for the function of many polysaccharides uh, as well as proteins. Um, but the, on the polysaccharide sides, uh, it's, uh, you know, for example, the glycosaminal glycans or also GAX uh, are a very famous type of molecule that uh, the audience may be familiar with. Um, so sulfated uh, GAGs, uh, such as uh, heparin sulfate, uh, uh, are very important in facilitating the interaction between signaling molecules and their cell surface receptors. For example, here um, uh, on the upper uh, left corner, you can see that uh, the fibroblast growth factor, or FGF, um, requires the binding with uh, heparin sulfate, which is a type of uh, uh, GAG on the cell surface in order to properly being recognized by its uh, receptor. Uh, FGF is definitely not alone. There are many other growth factors as well as other uh, cytokines and chemokines, uh, you know, function like this. Um, they require this binding interaction between cell surface uh, heparin sulfate, um, which is a, you know, highly sulfated polymer uh, to interact with their cell surface receptors. And this interaction also are important for uh, a variety of uh, you know, cell functions. Uh, but one notable function is a stem cell uh, fate determination or stem cell differentiation. Now, it turns out that uh, FGF, um, you know, the proper signaling of FGF um, will trigger the downstream you know, differentiation uh, function of the cells if properly signaled. Um, the cell surface uh, heparin sulfate and other uh, GAGs are also important to serve as decoy uh, receptors in signaling. Um, on the right of uh, this slide, you will see that uh, uh, the uh, heparinase, which is an enzyme that can uh, cleave the cell surface heparin sulfate, actually uh, plays an important role in regulating the growth factor signaling. Um, and the reason for this is that uh, the cell surface uh, heparin sulfate, um, which is also, you know, again, sulfated, uh, can uh, interact with um, the growth factors and uh, serve as uh, decoy receptors. Um, and so, you know, in other way, in other words, basically inhibiting them. Uh, but once the, the heparinase comes into function, they cleave off this uh, cell surface uh, glycans and the growth factor associated with them, and thereby activating uh, this uh, growth factor signaling pathway. In another recent example, people have shown, uh, I mean, uh, here people means uh, the Polinsky and the Jen Liu's groups. They have shown uh, that another uh, GAG, uh, which is uh, the chondroitin sulfate, 
uh, actually um, have this defined sufficient pattern. And that defined sufficient pattern uh, allows it to effectively neutralize the cytotoxic effect of circulating histones, um, uh, which is the uh, which is uh, you know released in the mouse model of sepsis. Um, you know th this can be uh, uh, attributed to the anti-inflammation function of chondroitin sulfate. Okay, so not only uh, the carbohydrate have uh, old sulfations, the old sulfation also occurs on peptides and the proteins. For example, tyrosine uh, old sulfation is a ubiquitous post-translational modification or PTM of proteins and the peptides. Um, in mammalian cells, it is estimated that about 1% of the total tyrosine residues are old sulfated, which is significant amount uh, if you consider, uh, you know, tyrosine being a very, uh, you know, common uh, amino acid residue in all proteins. Um, so many of the sulfur proteins, unfortunately, are not yet discovered or their functions are not really clear. Um, the functions of a sulfur proteins in the blood coagulation pathway uh, is one of the better understood functions of sulfur proteins. Um, here, uh, you can see that uh, this is, uh, you know, a figure from a work recently published by our colleague, also at Boston College, uh, uh, Professor um, uh, Ch uh, Abhishek Chatterjee. And his group actually studied the, um, the, the function of this uh, particular protein called a human heparin cofactor 2 or HC2. And in that uh, protein, the uh, N terminus of, of this HC2 actually is uh, sulfated at two residues, two tyrosine residues. And this acid, acidic N-terminal domain or AND uh, domain is important in uh, interacting with uh, the target protein, which is a thrombin, which is um, involved in the blood, blood coagulation pathway upon both of the protein binding to uh, GAGs. And uh, the Chatterjee group has uh, identified that uh, between the two tyrosine in the A and D domain, um, one of those uh, is more important than the other in terms of a binding to thrombin. And that shows you, you know, the sufficient pattern is important in its molecular recognition. Well, last but not least, and this is also very relevant to uh, the current, uh, you know, pandemic, um, the O-sulfated GAGs are also playing important role uh, in cellular entry of virus. Uh, so this is an example mentioned by Professor Hin Wan's uh, talk uh, in two weeks ago uh, in the same forum. Um, so it has been found that the heparin sulfates are co-receptors of SARS-CoV-2 um, you know, in addition to ACE2, uh, which is a more known uh, receptor for this uh, uh, spike protein of coronavirus. Uh, and the people have found that uh, uh, without the uh, heparin sulfate uh, uh, proteoglycan or with, uh, with heparin sulfate, but with uh, improper sulfation pattern, then um, the uh, binding of virus as well as the cellular entry uh, can be affected. Okay, so clearly uh, sulfation has a very important uh, biological significance. So uh, to which molecules do the sulfation occur? There are several class of molecules in, uh, in, in biology that are uh, sulfated. For example, glycopeptides, um, as I mentioned already, uh, the peptide uh, can be sulfated on the tyrosine residue, but also glycopeptide can be sulfated on their sugars too. So both the sugar as well as the peptide uh, residues can be sulfated uh, in glycopeptides. Uh, there are also li uh, liposaccharides, uh, which are you know, lipid molecules with sugar head groups, can also be sulfated on the sugar head groups. Um, the glycosaminoglycan uh, is something that I've already mentioned, uh, which have very interesting uh, phenomenon, which is so-called sulfation pattern, because mul multiple, sulf uh, multiple sites, multiple hydroxyl groups on the disaccharide repeating unit of uh, many GAGs, such as heparin sulfate or chondroitin sulfate uh, can be sulfated, but they can also uh, remain as a free hydroxyl, which create a very complex uh, pattern for this sulfate modification. 
Uh, and the sufficient pattern has been implicated in its molecular recognition as well as the function of many, uh, many things that we mentioned with the sulfate gas. Um, and also uh, small molecules can be sulfated too. Uh, in fact, um, the sulfation is a general strategy for our body to metabolize small molecules, right? Whenever we take a, uh, you know, a drug molecule uh, and it will eventually be cleared out from our body. And one of the important way to, uh, to clear them out is to sulfate them, uh, to make them more hydrophilic. Okay, so um, there are so many different uh, bioactive molecules that can be modified by the sulfate modification. Um, and so how to study their function uh, as well as their structures. An important strategy uh, to study the functional roles of the sulfation is to generate probes and the biomimetic molecules that can recapitulate the structures and the functions of those old sulfated biomolecules in nature. Uh, in the effort of synthesizing old sulfated uh, molecules, there are many two strategies. One is the so-called late stage old sulfation. The other one is um, the early stage old sulfation. So let's first take a look at the late stage old sulfation strategy. Um, and within this strategy, there are also two approaches chemical approach and the enzymatic approach. In the late stage uh, chemical sulfation of oligosaccharides, there's often this kind of a workflow uh, that's shown on the slides, on the, on the top part of the slides. Um, we start with uh, you know, uh, monosaccharide building blocks. The first thing to do is to orthogonally protect them uh, and keep in mind that uh, the uh, hydroxyls that we want to introduce the sulfate group uh, will be protected orthogonally compared to all the other hydroxyl groups so that they can selectively be protected at the later stage of the synthesis. Um, and then once we protected them, uh, then we can build the uh, backbone of the oligosaccharides um, and then that will be uh, further deprotected to reveal all this uh, hydroxyls to be sulfated. Um, and then uh, it'll be uh, it, 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 it'll, 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 it'll be uh, sulfated using SO2 amine, uh, sorry, S3 amine as a reagent uh, to convert it into the sulfate modification, All right? So um, the, this, this procedure has been the mainstay of a laboratory chemical approach for O-sulfation or late stage O-sulfation, uh, but it has suffered a, a series of uh, issues. For example, it's a very laborious uh, synthesis and very often the efficiency is not, isn't a great. Um, the scale of those sulfation reactions are not particularly high. Um, and the sulfated compounds are actually becomes very polar such that the purification becomes a challenge. Recently, uh, there's the enzymatic approach has emerged as a promising strategy for introducing old sulfation to carbohydrate. A typical enzymatic sulfation procedure Start, by, start from already constructed uh, oligosaccharide backbone with little or no protecting groups. Um, and itself often is a product of enzymatic glycosylation reactions. There are assembly uh, uh, you know, techniques that are, people have developed using enzymatic strategies to assemble those uh, carbohydrate backbones. Um, and then the, uh, this oligosaccharide will be treated with a series of uh, enzymes that can introduce the sulfate at the proper positions. Um, there are, these enzymes are usually the glyco, sorry, the, uh, the sulfotransferases. This, you know, the, the, these are the same type of proteins that install the sulfate groups in nature. Therefore, uh, they also have very good uh, selectivities as well as efficiencies. And these reactions are also uh, pretty good for scaling up. And there, ha there have been already a lot of progress in uh, scaling up the uh, sulfation reactions uh, to the industry uh, scale. However, um, uh, the enzymatic sulfation strategy also has its own limitations. In particular, um, the reaction sequence is relatively inflexible, meaning that uh, in order to sulfate, for example, the uh, six position of uh, the disaccharide of glycosaminal glycan, you have to first uh, sulfate the N position, uh, which is you know, uh, required by the function of the 2O sulfate, uh, 2O sulfotransferase. Uh, 
And the two O sulfation is also required by the function of six O uh, uh, sulfur transferase, right? So uh, you cannot uh, change this particular sequence. You have to start with N sulfation, uh, which is followed by the two O sulfation, which is followed by the six O sulfation. Um, another, uh, you know, issue with this is that even though the selectivity of this enzyme is pretty high, uh, conversely, it requires naturally occurring substrate. If your substrate is non-natural, uh, very often you will find that the enzymatic reaction will not proceed. Uh, and at, uh, at last, you also get a highly sulfated compound, which requires uh, relatively challenging separation, uh, and HPLC method is usually necessary. All right, in order to address all the challenges associated with uh, late stage uh, O-sulfation strategies, uh, people have developed the uh, so-called early stage sulfation approach as the alternatives. Um, the early stage sulfation usually start with uh, the monosaccharides and uh, the targeted hydroxyls are directly converted into sulfate diesters as, uh, uh, as a protected sulfates. Uh, in the early stage of the synthesis, usually at the mon monosaccharide level. And those um, sulfate diester uh, uh, sugars will be then converted into donors and acceptors, uh, which is followed by the glycosylation to build the uh, backbone. Um, and then eventually uh, it can be uh, globally deprotected to reveal all the sulfate groups. So um, the advantage of early stage O-sulfation is that it is much more concise compared to the late stage sulfation synthesis. It is also scalable um, and relatively easy to purify. You could purify um, the, uh, the, the material right before the global deprotection reaction. And usually the global deprotection reaction uh, uh, generates very little uh, if, uh, if there's any uh, byproduct. So you don't need to do the, the purification at the very last product. Um, However, uh, so there are already, uh, uh, sorry, uh, there are already a few different, uh, you know, uh, sulfate diesters that have been, uh, have been developed to affect the early stage O sulfation. Uh, the first one was uh, developed by Penny and Perlin in the uh, early uh, 1980s. Uh, and there are also notable contributions uh, from the Simpson group as well as uh, Scott Taylor's group uh, by introducing different uh, sulfate diesters such as uh, the trichloroethylene uh, and the new painting, so on and so forth. So among all of those uh, uh, sulfate diesters, there are still uh, limitations. For example, um, many of those uh, early stage sulfation uh, uh, strategy requires a relatively harsh condition for introducing those uh, sulfate diesters to the carbohydrates substrate as well as the deep protection requires relatively harsh conditions too. Um, the sulfate diesters are often uh, electro, uh, sorry, nucleophilic uh, success, susceptible uh, and uh, you have to really find uh, the regions uh, that are compatible with them. And last but not least, uh, they also have uh, per, uh, they also result in poor reactivity of the modified substrate. This is because the sulfate diesters uh, usually have electron withdrawing effect. And that can uh, disarm this uh, donor or acceptors and make their glycosylation reaction more challenging to conduct. All right, because of these uh, limitations, uh, we uh, wonder whether we can develop a new generation uh, early stage O sulfation strategy. And we actually got our inspiration from uh, this reaction called Sulfex. It's a sulfur six fluoride exchange reaction developed by uh, Sharpley's group. Uh, in 2014. And this reaction entails uh, um, the uh, reaction between a thylo ether, usually an aromatic thylo ether, and an aromatic fluoro sulfate. In the presence of the catalyst, the DBU, which is organo base, it can generate uh, the uh, sulfate diester as the main product, as well as the, the uh, thylo fluoride as the byproduct. And in fact, the formation of the silicon fluoride bond. Um, is the driving force of the reaction because of its, uh, you know, uh, very low bond energy. Um, so uh, inspired by this, uh, we envisioned that we could actually uh, perform this sulfax reaction on carbohydrate, which means that if we take a uh, silo glycose glycosyloether uh, 
and uh, make it react with aryl fluorosulfate, it can then generate the aryl glycosulfate diester, which, which can undergo selective cleavage to cleave the aryl protecting group and reveal the sulfate uh, on the carbohydrates. And this strategy could also be applicable to peptide and small molecules uh, and generate the corresponding osulfated uh, compounds as a product. All right, our investigation first began uh, with a model reaction between uh, a galactose uh, 6 TMS acetyl ether and uh, aerial sulfate, uh, aerial fluor sulfate. So the aerial fluor sulfate can be relatively conveniently generated uh, from the corresponding uh, modified uh, phenols. And the reason that we want to introduce uh, uh, you know, aromatic uh, substitutions on the phenolic, phenolic, uh, on the phenolic structure uh, is because we want to modulate the electronic property of those uh, uh, fluor sulfate and, and, and study whether those uh, modulation could actually change the uh, reactivity of the corresponding fluor sulfate. So this reaction can be relatively uh, efficiently conducted by simply reacting the phenols uh, with uh, sulfur fluoride. Uh, if you haven't uh, heard of this compound, you must have heard uh, the gas called uh, vicin, uh, which is the gas used for uh, fumigation. So whenever you, uh, you go to see a house that's been completely covered by uh, a tent, um, uh, and also if you have watched this uh, TV show uh, Breaking Bad, you will see actually, you know, this kind of a scene. Uh, the fumigation gas vicin is uh, in fact as a sulfur fluoride. So uh, it's a very toxic gas. Uh, and I want to make a disclaimer here that uh, this is something that you need to use with care, uh, uh, with caution. Um, and uh, our lab has developed a, a, a standard operational procedure. Uh, and I, uh, you know, I'm very happy to share with you if you are interested in this chemistry, right? Um, despite of this toxicity, uh, this is actually something that you can very conveniently to use. Uh, you can generate the fluor sulfate uh, in, very, in very, very high efficiency, as you can see on this table. Um, and after this, you can react with a, a glycosol uh, uh, a substrate to generate the corresponding sulfate diester. And we initially just used the, simply the, the sulfax condition uh, the, in the presence of DBU, and that has already be, uh, been able to generate the uh, corresponding glyco uh, aerial uh, sulfate diester in pretty good efficiency for many of these R groups. As you can see, as the R group uh, becomes more electron withdrawing, uh, then the efficiency of this corresponding sulfax coupling uh, increases. Um, uh, for the more electron donating group, however, uh, the corresponding sulfate diester uh, reaction is less efficient. Then uh, we move on to test whether uh, our hypothesis is, is true, and that is whether we can selectively deprotect this uh, uh, sulfate diester by removing this. Uh, uh, aerial uh, protecting group. Uh, and initially we just think that uh, we could just uh, simply treat it with uh, base, strong base. The reason is that uh, uh, by changing this R group, you can make this uh, aerial group a very good living group when the R group is electron withdrawing, right? And that actually can make the corresponding hydrolysis pretty selective and efficient on the aerial side of the uh, aerial glyco uh, sulfate, uh, sulfate diester. Uh, which is indeed true, as you can see, uh, the more electron withdrawing group turns out uh, to be a better living group in this hydrolysis reaction uh, in the presence of a five molar sodium uh, methoxide to generate the corresponding sulfate product in uh, pretty good efficiency. Um, as the uh, R group becomes more electron donating, the efficiency of the hydrolysis reduces. Uh, and based on this, uh, we come up with a mechanism uh, hypo uh, hypothesis for this hydrolysis reaction. Um, so this is the sulfate diester, uh, and this is the base um, sodium methoxide. The uh, the methoxide ion uh, will undergo will nucleophilically attack the sulfur center, um, and that is a typical SN two reaction. Um, the uh, phenol is basically the leaving group. And then you basically will get uh, a sulfate diester with a methyl group. And this methyl sulfate diester isn't stable. So there are only two ways um, for it to further decompose. Uh, 
One is that, um, you know, because we conducted this reaction in methanol, there will be a trace amount of uh, uh, water. This water will uh, nucleophilic attack uh, this metal group uh, to form, to form uh, uh, methanol and, and then as well as the sulfated sugar. The other pathway is that if it's um, uh, nucleophilically attacked by the methoxy uh, ion, uh, then it can also generate the sulfated sugar as well as uh, the uh, dim dimethyl ether as the side product. Either way, the sulfated sugar can be generated in relatively high efficiency. Okay, but we're still troubled by the fact that, that uh, uh, the, when the R group is electron donating, uh, we get a very little hydrolysis. So we switch to a different method uh, using hydrogenolysis to do the deprotection. It turns out that regarding, uh, regardless of the R group, the hydrogenolysis actually can afford the corresponding sulfate uh, in high efficiency. And this, this reaction was really uh, uh, you know, a pleasant surprise for us. And we want to study its mechanism, how what happens. So we are certainly not the first group to come up with the idea of deprotecting sulfate diesters in early stage sulfation uh, strategy uh, using hydrogenolysis. In fact, the first example of the early stage sulfation method developed by Penny and Perlin already used the uh, hydrogenolysis to deprotect the aerial group. But in their uh, paper, as well as some of the following papers, uh, people have proposed that the mechanism being that uh, the hydrogenolysis uh, hydrogenate the aromatic structure, which may convert it into, a, so for example, a cyclohexane, uh, a cyclohexanol structure, and which then quickly undergo uh, a nucleophilic substitution to generate the sulfated uh, sugar. Um, we're initially, we're a little bit troubled by this uh, mechan mechanistic hypothesis, because we have observed that that's less potent hydride source such as ammonium formate works pretty well in this reaction too. And it is pretty well established that this particular reagent ammonium formate cannot efficiently uh, 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 hydrogenate the aromatic structures. So then what happened, right? So then we actually did uh, you know, our own study to probe the mechanism of this reaction. So the, uh, our, our uh, mechanistic study is mainly conducted using gas chromatography uh, mass spectrometry, GCMS, uh, which entails that we uh, uh, perform this uh, hydrogenolysis reaction and we monitor using GCMS what's the other compound uh, than the sulfate sugar uh, that's being generated in the process, right? We also used, uh, you know, three uh, purified compound as a standard, just to, start to serve as a reference in GCMS. So we found out that uh, uh, in all of these reactions, um, it exclusively only generated the corresponding area in structure. Um, for example, if uh, this is uh, the uh, phenol, uh, uh, sorry, it's, if it's phenyl uh, uh, glycol sulfate diester, then after hydrogenolysis, we only found benzene uh, in the product. And there's no cyclohexanone being generated in the process. Okay. All right. Then we changed this R group to different uh, substitutions. For example, we changed it to uh, methoxy or uh, trifluoro uh, methyl group. And in all of them, uh, it, it's found that uh, this uh, corresponding area is being generated, and there's no uh, phenol or uh, cyclo, uh, cyclohexanol being generated in the process. Um, and uh, there are some uh, side product when, when we do hydrolysis, hydrogenolysis for too long, and that is uh, the uh, triethylamine, which is the reduction product um, of uh, ACE2 nitrile, which is the solvent that we used in this reactions. Okay, so based on this observation, uh, we, uh, we found that this previous, re previously reported the mechanistic uh, hypothesis is probably wrong. And our proposed mechanism involves uh, the palladium insertion into the CO bound rather than SO bound, right? So in, uh, this insertion uh, will then undergo this uh, hydride transfer as well as reductive uh, elimination to generate corresponding sulfated sugar uh, 
as well as uh, the palladium uh, uh, aerial structure, which then, uh, which then collapse into the corresponding areas. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, we have already confirmed what kind of uh, you know, ways that we can form and deprotect uh, this to a corresponding uh, sulfate diester. We still want to do a, a you know a, a final optimization optimization of the sulfax coupling before expanding the substrate scope. Uh, so we uh, first of all we were a little bit troubled by the fact that some of this electron donating uh, uh, phenol structures do not actually result in higher yield uh, in the coupling reaction. So we uh, uh, tested you know uh, a new reaction condition by changing the base from DBU to TBD. And it turns out that TBD is a more efficient catalyst in this uh, sulfax reaction and can result in the corresponding sulfate diester in higher yield. For example, in this methyl, paramethyl structure, uh, we can improve the yield from 29% to quantitative. Um, another optimization is that we found that it can be done, the, the, the sulfax reaction to introduce the sulfate diester can be done in a one part manner. Um, so this can be uh, 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 achieved by uh, changing this uh, uh, TMS protecting uh, TMS, TMS reagent uh, from TMS chloride to uh, hexamethyl disalazine uh, or HDMS, which is compatible with uh, the fluorosulfate. And then you can add the DBU or TBD to generate the corresponding sulfate diester. All right, with that condition optimization, uh, we then expanded this uh, chemistry to a variety of different substrates, as well as a variety of different uh, positions uh, uh, to introduce a sulfate diester. As you can see, uh, we used either the stepwise uh, procedure or the one part procedure to generate the sulfate uh, diester compounds. And all of them generate uh, the compound in relatively high yield, right? Um, we also uh, try to uh, see if that uh, our group can uh, uh, allow further optimization of the reactivity in the sulfax as well as in the deprotection reaction. And indeed, we found that uh, uh, our different R groups uh, actually can optimize the reactivity for different substrates. So you will see that some of our substrates carries, uh, you know, uh, one R group, and some of the others carry the other R group. Um, we indeed found that some of these reactions are less efficient than the others. For example, this particular substrate, uh, uh, which uh, sulfates are at the uh, three position uh, of glucose, as well as uh, this one uh, sulfate at the four position are less efficient than the others. So then we uh, studied that what happens to those less efficient reactions and what are the side reactions? We found that uh, uh, it is in fact, um, the corresponding hydrolyzed the TMS, that's the only side product that we can observe, uh, which is probably attributed to the steric hindrance of the corresponding positions, right? So the fluorosulfate is relatively bulky. And when, there, when there's a relatively bulky uh, protecting group on the site, uh, this, this reaction could actually be less efficient compared to many other positions. But luckily, uh, this uh, because of the uh, hydrolyzed uh, stylo ether is the sole byproduct, we could easily recycle this byproduct and resubject it into the next round of reaction. So in this way, we could actually eventually get uh, a recycled yield pretty high. We also try to expand this chemistry to uh, different type of uh, positions as well as, well as uh, different uh, substitution groups. We found that uh, all of them can generate uh, uh, you know, the corresponding product in pretty good yield as well as, uh, you know, uh, good quantity. And notably, we also uh, can generate corresponding sulfate diester groups um, in, uh, in non carbohydrate substrates, such as this small molecule as this, as well as this amino acid. Okay, um, so this chemistry turns out it's pretty compatible with a variety of different uh, 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 glycochemistry conditions. Uh, for example, acidic, basic, uh, unsulfation, uh, oxidizing and reducing conditions. So because of the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into details uh, about those chemistries. Uh, and I, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have um, in the Q&A part. Um, so the, uh, most importantly, this chemistry uh, is compatible with glycosylation re reaction, which is probably the most important thing for uh, early stage sulfation strategy.
we found that uh, the sulfated compound can serve both as an acceptor or as a donor uh, in the corresponding reaction to generate the uh, uh, disaccharide in good yield. And, uh, and uh, it's noteworthy to, uh, that when both uh, donor and acceptor are uh, modified by the sulfate diester, we could still generate the uh, corresponding disaccharide in uh, good efficiency. And this uh, glycosylation reaction can be further optimized by changing either the R group on the aerial side as well as different uh, uh, donor chemistry. And eventually we could achieve, for example, this disaccharide in 95% coupling uh, efficiency, which is pretty good. Um, last but not least, we uh, take all this uh, sulfate diester modified compounds and we subject it into hydrogenolysis. Uh, it's uh, pretty straightforward that we could generate the corresponding sulfated compounds in good yields. All right, so uh, because I'm running out of time, uh, I will just uh, skip the discussion on the peptide part, uh, but you could you know, imagine that this can also be done uh, on peptides as well. Okay. All right, so uh, in summary, we have done early stage osulfation of carbohydrates, uh, and I didn't talk about the peptides. Uh, and and uh, th this, this chemistry is pretty efficient. It's, uh, it's relatively rapid. It has pretty broad functional group compatibility and a very efficient uh, and selective uh, for deprotection reaction. So we're actually now applying this chemistry in building glycomimetic polymers. All right, with that, I'd like to you know, thank my group. Uh, and I want to especially point out uh, this work is done by graduate student Chao Liu and uh, postdoc uh, Chang Ji Young. Uh, as well as undergraduates, uh, Siu Wang, as well as Samenza Ferraro. Uh, I'd like to finally thank uh, the, all the funding agencies to make this possible. All right, thank you. <laughs>